Good evening and welcome everyone uh, to this in injury prevention um, presentation. My name is Kieran Ambler, I'm the Development Manager for Christchurch Metro Cricket. Um, just before we start, just a few little um, procedures, um, help, a bit of housekeeping I suppose. Um, if you do need to go toilet, just through the um, just through the doors and straight across, it's still inside the building. Um, and if there's any um, sort of shakes or, or fire or anything like that, we, we just go exit the, um, the back of the uh, building here, um, straight out onto the, to the field. Okay. Um, look, oh, and, and the other thing, if you haven't signed in, there's some sign-in sheets. Um, that's probably going to be the most complicated thing of this whole evening. There's, there's two sets on two different um, bar leaners there, so if you can, um, sign in. And if, your name's not there, put your name down and your email address um, so then we can send some information to you um, later on as well. Okay. Um, just, look, we're very lucky to um, have this presentation tonight um, from such um, high quality um, presenters. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's one of the reasons why that we've got such a great turnout um, here this evening. But, but also, um, we've got a great turnout because obviously um, you all want to, to learn and um, yeah, understand uh, some of this stuff from, from the experts. So, well done. Thank you for, uh, for turning up tonight and um, we look forward to getting, getting started. Um, I just want to thank uh, Christ College, um, Rob Clark and Christ College for offering to, to host this evening. Um, it's a fantastic facility um, that we can host it in here. So thanks very much, Rob. Um, yeah, we'll get, get straight into it. Um, I'd like to um, invite Amos Johnson um, to kick us off. Um, Amos was the Canterbury Cricket Physio uh, for about seven years, so he's seen his fair share of uh, back-related injuries and, and, and bowling-related injuries. So um, he'll kick us off, off with a wee bit of... Um, information about this initiative and uh, introduce this team. Thanks very much. Cool, thanks Kieran. A little over a year ago, a young man walked into my office. He was complaining of back pain when he bowled. He was an under 15 Canterbury rep, one of the top players in his club and his school. He had just finished his third game in three days, and after bowling on the third day in a row, he developed back pain. This young man, like so many bowlers before him, had suffered a stress fracture, and this had ended his season. A little after this, I had a discussion with a well-respected fast bowling coach, and we came to the conclusion that more needed to be done to improve the knowledge of bowling injuries in our young bowlers. Over the past few months, our group has researched, analysed and collaborated to bring you this presentation, the Canterbury Youth Bowling Initiative. My name is Amos Johnson and I would formally like to welcome you here tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce to you the five members of our group. First up, we have current Black Cap and the lucky recipient of two metal screws in his lower back, courtesy of a stress fracture, Matt Henry. <laughs> then we have a former uh, manager of New Zealand High Performance <coughs> and fast bowling guru, Dale Headley. Then we have former manager of New Zealand Medical, uh, New Zealand Cricket Medical, and uh, sports edition at Sportsmed, Dr. Rob Campbell. <laughs> then we have the former Black Caps physiotherapist and the head of New Zealand Cricket um, Physiotherapy and Medical, Dale Shackle. And lastly, former Black Cat and current coach of the Sydney Thunder, Shane Bond. So these are the goals of tonight. 
So, number one, we're trying to highlight the risk factors for stress-related back injuries in our young fast bowlers. Two, provide pathways in the event of an injury. And three, encourage communication to ensure all parties are acting in the best interests of our athletes. Now, thank you so much for your questions. There was heaps of them. This is only about half. Um, and most of them are related to technique, loading, and injury prevention. And that's what we're going to try and cover off today. But if you have any other questions that you want to ask during the presentation, at the end of each speaker's section, there'll be an opportunity to do that. Or if you don't feel comfortable doing it then, at the, following the end of the presentation, we can do it then. So please just raise your hand and myself or Karen will come around to you with the microphone. So here's a little bit of an overview of how the presentation will roll tonight. First of all, we have a bit of a discussion with Matt around his injury experiences. Then we'll be explaining the risks and challenges around our bowling injuries. Then Dale Hadley will be reviewing technique and then Shane will be covering off loading. Then together, Dale and Rob We'll be looking into stress fractures and the related pathways. So this will be the end of the formal presentation, so people are welcome to leave then, but we will have further questions afterwards. So I'd now, now like to invite Matt to the, to the stage. So Matt, thanks so much for coming in tonight. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you on. Um, so I understand you made the Canterbury team in 2011, just pretty much fresh out of school, uh, and uh, shortly after you suffered a stress fracture. Um, you know, what were your experiences, you know, why do you think you got injured? Um, yeah, like you mentioned, uh, coming from high school, uh, playing a lot of cricket, uh, but I was only playing probably the Saturday and Sunday. Um, and during the week I was bowling a lot, but probably at a lower intensity just during the week in the nets and, and probably not to the same intensity when I played for Canterbury. So when I came to Canterbury, all of a sudden you demanded to ask um, to bowl every day um, and you're pretty much bowling for your career. You wanted to really impress and bowl to the big dogs. So that was probably the biggest step up for me and I think that was when my body wasn't quite strong enough. Um, I, I could ask my body to probably bowl quick but my body hadn't quite developed. So what I found was, uh, it was actually around Christmas time, I'd already bowled about 30 or 40 overs in the week, and then I got asked to net bowl to Brendan, not blaming Brendan McCullum on my stress fracture, but um, uh, yeah, so I, I, got for I was fortunate enough to actually net bowl to him, but I ended up bowling another 10 to 15 overs in that session, which absolutely blew my loads um, right out the window. And what the problem was, it wasn't actually the next week that I was sore. I was actually fine for quite a while, probably two weeks after, and then I started getting just a, what I'd describe as probably a dull ache. Um, that was just, the, the way I could describe it was probably like a thumb just pressing in my lower back. And uh, that was probably where I realised something wasn't quite right. So you, you're talking a little bit about the symptoms then. Um, was it always just a little bit of an ache, or did they range? You know, what were your symptoms like? Yeah, I think that was probably the hardest thing from a young young bowling point of view. Uh, I'd never really been injured before, so um, I was just, I, I couldn't quite describe it. I was like, I'm, I'm a little bit sore, but it wasn't that bad, but it kept on just slowly getting worse. And I found that in the morning, I'd be fine, I'd wake up, I could touch my toes, do my stretching, do a bit of bowling, that was okay. But as soon as I went into the nets, I lifted my intensity, that was when I started getting sharp pain from my back. And then from there, um, I'd kind of get home, I was like, wow, that wasn't, Quite right, um, and then I wake up in the morning. I'm like, oh, actually, I'm okay again here today. Do my stretching, get back into it, go bowl again. And I was in the same space, and I, I, I carried that off quite a period of time, and it just got gradually worse and worse and worse. And I started getting neural pain and bits and pieces like that. But it was quite hard to differentiate at the time. It just felt like a, like I said before, like a little wee thumb pressing in my back. Yeah. So we often see that you know, like kids just coming in with. You know, stiffness, you know, rather than actually full blown, you know, back pain. Um, so, what were your, your learnings from that? I mean, what, what do you do differently now? I think the, the biggest learning for me was one, recording my loads. Uh, when I was younger, I was kind of, oh, I don't get injured, so I'm fine. So, I just carried on bowling, I bowled a lot. Um, and the biggest learning wasn't actually the number I was bowling, it was actually the intensity I was bowling at. So, 
every day bowling to my brother in the nets, um, imitating him, my fast bowler hero, so it <laughs> didn't really cause the issue. It was actually once I started playing for that next level up, playing competitive cricket every day in and out, and that was when the, the issue started probably happening. Um, and that was the biggest learning would be just recording the loads because it's not to stop you from playing cricket. I think that's the biggest thing um, that I learned was I shouldn't be lying about what I'm doing because they're going to stop me from playing cricket. It's actually just having a bit of a, um, a guidance of how many have I bowled this week. So if I have had a massive workload in the next week, maybe just, just lay it off a little bit of training and save that for the game so I can actually perform and, and not break down. Yes, yeah, so I remember a, a game that we, we had you on in, in the Canterbury team uh, a couple of years ago, and, a, and it was a you know, big load for you that game. You only end up on 55 overs. Um, <clears throat> you know, what, what kind of happened after that? So, you want to give us a bit of that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I was, I was released to play for Canterbury and uh, the game was on the line. We played uh, against Wellington and we enforced a follow-on, so there's naturally a, a bit of a jump in the loads. I'm about 55 overs, but I actually felt fine. Um, I mean, I've done a lot of conditioning and strength work and I could get through that and I was okay. Um, and I was trying to find my way back into the test team, so it was one of those moments where I was happy to keep doing it. It wasn't until the week after um, when I was actually playing the test where I realised, wow, I'm actually quite cooked here because it's actually the aftermath of those big weeks. And I think that's probably getting the understanding of your body. Um, it's a lot easier for me to say it now because I'm, I've played a lot more cricket, but by having those numbers there and understanding that, well, I've had a massive spike this next two weeks or three weeks, just to be careful, be a bit wary. Um, because naturally they're going to happen when you're in situations like that. Thanks very much, Matt. Cheers. I'll just invite Dale up to talk about risk factors. Um, all right. So these are generally accepted as probably the, the significant factors in, in leading to injury for pace bowlers. Um, first one being pace. Now, that that doesn't. It's probably a little bit of a uh, misnomer to a certain extent. Just the faster you bowl, the the uh, the more likely it is. I mean, spin bowlers get stress fractures. So I think with this one is is probably more about the intensity, and it probably leads to Max point there. That it's the intensity that you're doing. So I think um, so. That's that's one thing is is around the intensity and how you try and. Um, monitor that. Uh, the other one, the technique. So there's probably two main things around technique. So one is side flexion, how much you bend this way, and the counter rotation. And Dale Hadley will um, talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, loading. So loading. I'm sure you've heard of all of that stuff, and it can mean a hell of a lot of different things to different people. Um, so in the bowling context. Um, Basically what, we, what we're looking at is trying not to under bowl, but also avoid over bowling. And Shane's going to talk a little bit more about the details of that. But those are two things related to loading. There's, there's probably other weekly factors. So they, they talk about roughly 50 overs a week as being a real threshold. Matt just talked about it there. Um, where that can, your chances of getting injured increase um, a lot when you bowl those sort of, sort of numbers. Um, the other one's rest periods. So if we can have some regular rest periods, and that's in the week, so times when you don't bowl. Um, and then also varying your loading, and that can be through the month. So you might have a three-week period where you load a lot, but then you have a relative rest week. And again, that's, that's individually based. And I think that's the main thing with loading is that is different for different individuals and that's where Matt talks about the recording so that you know what works for you as an individual. Um, general health, uh, so this comes into things like looking after yourself, uh, we're talking about nutrition, uh, alcohol, obviously no one here will be having alcohol especially on Christ College grounds. Um, the, so there's things like that, looking after yourself, sleep, so getting plenty of sleep, um, it's one of the big recovery methods um, for the body. Um, and with that as well is, is things like illness. 
and making sure that you get yourself over all your illnesses and injuries before you kind of go back out and thrash yourself again. Um, the previous injuries um, is a big risk factor for any kind of injury. So basically your biggest predictor of your next injury is one you've had before. So if you've had a stress fracture before, your chances of getting another one are significant. Which is basically um, comes back to that point where we're trying to make sure we get over those injuries and we don't push ourselves when we haven't fully recovered. Um, and age, so generally the younger you are with stress fractures, um, we talk about skeletal maturity, um, which is around 24 for males. Um, so below that, your, your chances of having bone injuries are increased. But that's not to say that you can't get them um, as you get older. But certainly younger school age people where the, the bones aren't quite as strong, then your uh, risk is increased. Well, good evening. I don't want to be a doom and gloom merchant. Everybody aspires to play for their country, they, they want to do well, but there are things that you have to be aware of. One of them is scheduling. Unfortunately, the rugby season and the cricket season don't always marry that well together. And you've got people who are training very hard for rugby, then all of a sudden the cricket starts to encroach. And because of that, players are not prepared well enough before they start playing the game. And um, the pre-season build-ups, I think, in many of the schools is really quite inadequate. And I think when you see what Shane's got to say about loading, I think that'll become abundantly clear. The surfaces that people train on is a, a real pet hate of mine. I go around schools and we have the groundsmen prepare the batting strip. They never prepare the bowling footmarks. So bowlers have to run in and bowl in the outfield. And this leads to injury and it's really unfair on the bowlers. And I'd really make a plea if there are any groundsmen here or principals of school to put some money aside to put some bowling pads in. The weather is also a major influence. When it's wet, does that mean to say you can't do your loading? Well, you need to find a way. And to find a way might be in the school gymnasium with a tennis ball and bowling at a low intensity. You can still get your loads up and keep them going, even though the weather's not in the way you'd want it to be. Now, one of the other pet bugbears that I have is the pre-season tournaments. The trips to Australia, or the trips up, the trips up to Palmerston North to play in a quadrangular tournament, and often in September. Now, if you listen to what Shane's got to say, it takes about, I think, eight to 12 weeks, Shane, is it, to prepare your body before you should even play your first game. And yet we've got these two tournaments and tours happening when players are coming out of the rugby season or soccer season, going off to play competitive cricket against Australians or other high schools, where you can't tell me that if someone whacks you for four that you're going to bowl at level two the next ball. So my plea is to really think carefully about loading your bowlers up before you go on those trips, not during them, because often injuries will cut those bowlers out for the rest of the season. The Christmas period is another issue which uh, can create problems, where people go on holiday, have a great time, uh, and then they come back to school and they're straight back into competition. And my plea there is that if you go on holiday, find a way to keep your bowling workloads ticking along while you're away. And then the other bugbear from time to time is the key word of winning. Everybody wants to be successful, everyone wants to win. But sometimes winning uh, becomes the number one thing for the school because you've got scholarship people and you've got reputations. Uh, you've got, dare I say, coaches whose reputation is on the line by results. Uh, you've got parents who uh, maybe push their children far too hard. Uh, the number one thing I'd like parents to do is to encourage and provide opportunities. And then the athletes themselves, they, they want to be successful because they want to move all the way through the grades and play for their country. But the plea is really prepare your body and take it step by step. Now I want to spend a little bit of time on technique. One of the questions that Shane and I get asked more than any other 
How can I bowl faster? We get it all the time. Even our first class players, the coaches say, can you get that person to bowl faster? And I ask, they always give the uh, reply, why? Why do you want them to bowl faster? Because if you've got youngsters at high school trying to bowl fast, it is absolutely positive that they're going to lose their technique as they stress and strain to try and get the ball down the other end quickly. And that's when injuries will occur. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time looking at uh, technique. Um, we have to be aware, and this is where the physios become and the trainers become important, you have to prepare your body before you can bowl fast, and that can take many, many years. If you expect to bowl fast as a 13 or 15 or 17 year old, okay, you take the risk. There's some international bowlers, um, international bowlers up here, and I think you should be able to recognise all those. There's something in common with all those bowlers, even though they're all very unique in their techniques. I wonder if anybody would like to tell me what is common to each of those bowls. They have all had stress fractures. And because of the stress fractures that they had, they had to rebuild their bodies, in some cases remodel their techniques, so that they could build up a body that could cope with what they were trying to do. And I think there are great examples of what needs to be done. Now, as far as technique's concerned, there's some pretty basic principles. And I work on the fact that every bowler has got their uniqueness. And I don't want to take that away. I don't want to clone people. But there are things that they need to be able to do. And that is to keep their head going to the target. If the head's going sideways, your balance is going sideways. If head's going straight ahead, you've got every chance of being in the right place. The run-up should be not absolutely straight, but as direct towards the target as possible. The arms should be rhythmical, not going across the body, but going ahead in a relaxed way. The feet should be landing, what I call running the tracks. How you get into the tracks is up to your, your uniqueness. But when you get into your takeoff step, your back foot landing and your front foot landing and follow through step, they should be in line. If they're not, your body is unbalanced. And if I could explain it uh, the most simple way possible, if you've got your head over your feet for every step of the run-up and the delivery, and if your eyes are level, then you will be in perfect balance. Okay, so that is the principle that I work from. How do you get into that position? So what I'd like to do, I'm going to ask Matt Henry to come up and be my guinea pig. technique, in my view, is to work on a conversation position. So, Matt, you can have a conversation with me right here. We are facing each other, our feet are pointed to each other, Matt's shoulders and hips in total balance with his feet. Now, if I want to make, uh, make Matt into a side-on bowler, don't move, lift up your front arm, lift up your front leg, there is a side-on bowler. The feet and the shoulders are matching. And you'll be looking through his elbow, and he should be in perfect balance. If I start moving around this way, ouch, ouch. Yep. Right. All right, so that's our conversation position for a side-on bowler. I'm now going to move to here, feet facing me, where his feet are, what I would say, zero degrees to the stumps, 90 degrees sideways with side-on bowler. We're now at 45 degrees. Lift up your front arm, lift up your front leg. Now he's in perfect balance to being what I call a semi-open bowler or a 45 degree looking just inside his elbow. Now we'll have a conversation here. Lift up the front leg. And now there's the open bowler. The feet are pointing zero degrees straight ahead, being in perfect balance, going back to the conversation position. 
Okay. Next is three spots. Now we don't all have access to a biomechanical lab. So I've invented my own little biomechanical lab. Something that any coach can do, any parent can do. And what I'm doing is looking for the direction, the hips and the shoulders. So very hard as a coach to actually see the shoulders working. And I'm getting a little bit uh, past it these days, and I can't rely on my eyes, so I've got to use the camera to do all this sort of stuff. But I can see quite quickly, if Matt just takes a step back, just walk towards me, Matt, and just pretend you're going through evolving action. Just watch those, see how the pole's moving? You can see how the poles are going, it's going sideways. Then, Then I put poles on the hip line. Now, if everything's going well, they should work together. We might find out why you have a stretch direction. <laughs> See how those poles work together. And to, to, for the athlete to have feedback about how it's working, then I connect the two of them. Rebel sports got all this stuff if you want. <laughs> So, I want Matt to do now. The reason why I connect the two is so that the bowler can actually feel whether the hips and shoulders are separating. And this is what we call counter rotation, where the hips and shoulders are getting away from each other. So, it just goes through lovely action. And you can see straight away that the hips and shoulders are working together, so that's what I would call a safe action. So, we're looking at the conversation position. We're going through this sort of series, and for those who access the website, you'll see all this on the website. I'm going to ask Shane to come and do a little demonstration. Thank you, Dale. We're going to go back to that topic about um, wanting to bowl faster. Dale's just talked about how do you bowl faster. Now the goal that Dale's just talked about is to keep the hips and the shoulders aligned the whole time. The fact is if you want to bowl faster, you do the opposite. And I just want to give you a little demonstration about how that works. So you're talking about hip and shoulder separation, which will give you pace, but is much more likely to cause you an injury. Okay? So I want to use this lovely swivelly chair to provide the example. If I sit on this chair, and I'm going to throw this little medicine ball, and I try and keep my hips and shoulders aligned, so I'm working together. And I throw the ball, just using my feet. That's about as much power as I can get. Now if I separate my hips and my shoulders, so I move my legs to one side and my shoulders to the other, and I push the other way, that's the power that I can generate. So you can see the force that I can get when I separate those hips and shoulders. So the thing about wanting to bowl faster, is, yeah, it's great if you want to do that, and you, some bowlers can take the risk, but there's some consequences that come with it. From a coaching point of view for us, the number one thing is to keep you safe, keep you on the park, keep enjoying the cricket. So we would much rather have your hips and shoulders aligned than to coach that. See you again soon. I just, just want to finish on uh, a current international player, Joffrey Archer who's probably got one of the smoothest techniques of anybody around. And if you have a look back, the sort of things I'm looking for, head over feet, eyes level, balance, and the only time that you can have a little bit of a problem is at the delivery, we talked about flexion, lateral flexion, that's sort of bending just in here. If the head has gone well outside the feet, there's going to be a lot of stress into the side of the body, and that's, that can lead to stress fractures, and a full follow through. So, I think all people, youngsters, they will look at different players, and they think, I like that, I like that, I like that, they try and imitate. And eventually, you imitate different things, and eventually put it into the concrete mixer, and out comes you. But as long as you have got some basic principles in place, as I mentioned before. Any questions about that?
care. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Uh, it may be sort of ironic that I'm up here talking about injury prevention, given my history. Actually, Amos asked ACC to fundraise the evening, or to sponsor the evening. When they found out I was involved, they said, bugger off, we're going to spend too much money on you. So, let's all assume, everything being equal, you've got a good technique as a young fast bowler. Dale's done the sexy part, part with the pitches and stuff. I'm doing the stuff that's a lot more dry. It's around the loading. How much do you bowl, pretty much? So when I came into the Black Caps, bowling coach, I came from a playing history. So I started when I was six, like probably a number of you males and females have here. Played till I was a, a month shy of 35. Up until the age of 17, never had an injury. I was very, very short. Still bowled reasonably quick, but no problems. 17 to 31, seven stress fractures or recurring stress fractures. Missing five years of, of the game and surgery on my back. So bowling and injury prevention and bowling with youngsters is something that I'm passionate about and I think it's important as coaches and as parents that we do as much as we can to look after our young players. And loading is about that. It's about you as a coach looking after your players. What is it loading? It's not about stopping you bowling. You'll hear it on TV all the time from commentators. I don't get this loading. You've just got to bowl and bowl and bowl and bowl and that's what will make you better. It's not about that for me. There are two parts to loading. Number one, it's about performance. How do I get the best out of my players? So when I came into the Black Caps team, uh, as Matt would have talked about, bowlers inputted numbers into a spreadsheet and got nothing back. What I wanted to know was, how is Matt Henry different to Trent Bolt, different to Tim Sally, Sally different to Neil Wagner? And you'll, if you put all those numbers in and spit it out, there were some real things that came out of real interest for me. So. Someone like Neil Wagner, for example, is an outlier. So I would get Matt Henry, Tim Southey, Trent Bolt to try and bowl 35 to 40 overs in a four-day game, leading into a test match. That's what they could, they could do, and I was happy with it. I'd turn up, look at the game, Neil Wagner would bowl 50 to 60 overs, and my hair would about to fall out, saying, Neil, what are you doing? And he would just ask me to bowl. What I learned over time is Neil could cope with 50 to 60 overs. Okay? Adam Milne was the other end of the spectrum. <coughs> Trying to prepare him for a World Cup, bowling 150 kilometres an hour, had two side strains. Why is he having side strains? Turns out he's bowling five, six overs before those games that he bowled really fast. So he could sit back down and lead into the World Cup. We stopped at him bowling before the World Cup, before matches. So that's a performance criteria for, from my point of view. How do you manage your bowlers as best as we can? How do we stop injuries? And then the other part is about, as I said, the injury side of things. What is your tolerance as a bowler? How much can you cope with? And everybody is very, very different. The second part, you must bowl and bowl to get better. There's only so much the body can take. And you don't have to be a black cat at 17. You can get there at 26 and play for 10 years. The main thing is you will get better if you are playing in games. And so the whole objective of loading is to get you playing as many games as you can, as injury free as you can. The same thing applies for spin bowlers. I think Dale mentioned it before, I've got two very, very talented young spin bowlers at the Thunder. Both had stress fractures over the coming years. So what I'm going to go through here is around the, the guidelines and parameters for bowling and what it looks like, working into a really simple bowling plan, which I'm hoping I'll explain very simply for you and you'll understand it. Uh, and it might give you an idea of some basic principles that you can apply simply as a coach. The last one is who decides. Now what, what that means for me is, as the coach for my team, I make the decision. In conversation with my players, but I make the decision. And there'll be plenty of coaches and parents out there who will say, you've just got to get there out there and bowl and bowl and bowl and bowl. And it's very difficult for an athlete to say, well, I actually don't want to bowl today. I've already bowled two days in a row and knackered. And so the questions and the information I'm going to give you is hopefully you can ask some players, but as a coach, you have to make a decision. If a player often says to you, and I don't know a player who doesn't want to play and doesn't want to bowl, but if a player says to you, I don't want to bowl today, sometimes it's taken as they're being soft, or they don't care, or they don't want to play. Every player is an individual and you have to treat them like that. So there are a range of different faces and boys and girls in the audience today. Not all of them are rec players. Not all of them are elite athletes. So you have to treat them differently. Some will be doing different sports, some will be training more. So you've got to make sure that you're treating everybody individually. 
these are the guidelines that you'll find in terms of bowling for New Zealand cricket. This is on their blackcaps.co.nz website. So all the information that you want is already out there. Lots of numbers and stuff that's around training and bowling stuff, and I'll go into it. I'll simplify it down for you. The same information can be found on the Australian website as well. So there's the Australian bowling. I like the bit down the bottom here with the common sense approach. The guidelines are general in nature, and every bowler needs to be managed on an individual basis. Some will cope with more or less load, and there are other more other important variables other than age, e.g. physical maturity, technique, bowling speed, fitness, previous injury, and all the factors that Dale talked about before. So all the information is there. Now, there's been a lot of studies in, on fast bowling in adolescence, and it's real dry. Anyone who's done academic reading knows it's, it's a sand sandwich. It's horrible to read through. But if you cut through it all, this is what basically all the information tells you. Bowl somewhere between two and four times a week. Bowl somewhere between 20 and 30 overs a week. When I'm talking 20 and 30 overs a week, I'm talking at full steam, okay? As hard as you can. Rest in between bowling sessions. So take a day off. And as Dale talked about, there's an inherent risk if you under bowl or over bowl. That's pretty much the main guidelines that all you have to worry about. So as a coach, Really, the questions you want to ask your athlete are how many days have you bowled in a row? How many overs have you bowled? How are you feeling? And if a kid says, I've bowled twice in a row and I'm tired, then the, probably the, the wise thing to do would be perhaps you have a day off bowling today. Any questions around that? Simple so far? So f I just wrote this lovely anagram, I think it is, first. Frequency, how many times you bowl a week? Intensity, and I'll go into intensity levels in a minute when I talk about a basic bowling program. Rest, that is days off. So some of you here will do weights. It's the same principle as doing weights. You would lift for a day, you need to take a day off to let the body recover, and then you lift again. You don't lift weights day after day after day, or you just get tired. Same applies to bowling. The surface, indoors and outdoors, and the type of training. The type of training I mean is, are you bowling in the Following a gymnasium here with a tennis ball, are you in the nets, are you an open wicket, are you a match? So they say there's around a 15-20% difference between the intensity of bowling in the nets to bowling in a match. So as a coach you have to take that into account. Dale hates these words, acute and chronic workload. Now when we talk about keeping a diary for young athletes, these are the two things that we'll talk about. Chronic load is basically a four week average, and it's a rolling average. And I'll explain it. Acute is a short term, so it's what you bowled in the last seven days. And that's a rolling average as well. Does anyone not know what I mean by a rolling average? Take this for example. In this seven days here, there's 18 overs, okay? So when you get back to Monday here, you scrap that Monday, and you add the seven days. So the acute average here would be 18, yet to this Monday it would be 24. Then the Tuesday would drop out, it would be 24. When we get to the Wednesday, it would still be 24. Get to the Thursday, this would drop out, it would still be 24. That's what I mean by rolling average. Does everybody understand that? Does that make sense? The same thing applies for the chronic workload, it's a roll. The, the day drops out every time. Spike means a jump in the chronic load of more than 150%. So what that means is over the course of a whole month, if I bowl 20 overs every week for a month, if in one of the next week I bowled 30 overs or more, that's a spike. It's more than 150% over the monthly average. That's a risk. Have I confused anyone yet? Does everybody understand that? Please put your hand up if you don't, because I can try and explain it a little bit better. Now we're into intensities. The top two are DRs, and I really like them. Negative one intensity is basically standing there with the ball in your hand, flicking out of your wrist, pretty much. And level zero is standing halfway down, just bowling into a net. Level one, very slow, half a run up, easing it down, down the wicket. Level two, full or half run up, or so full run up, or three quarter run up at 80%, and level three is at full intensity. They're the three levels I'm really working off when I 
illustrate this, this loading plan. So for the, for the sake of the graph, or the, the stuff that I'm going to show shortly, level 1 is blue, level 2 is orange, level 3 is green, and the spike is red, and I'll show you where there's a match. So I'm going to use an analogy for those who don't, I'm starting to confuse with the bowling, because it can be confusing when I'm talking over. So I'm going to talk about, this was a six, this is, a, this is the guidelines here for a 16 year old fast bowler in New Zealand. These are the guidelines. You can bowl 14 overs per day in a match with six over spells, and you are recommended to bowl two training sessions per week, 12 overs with an ideal total overs of 26 at full intensity. Okay, that's for a 16 year old fast bowler. Down the bottom here when we talk about tournaments, if you times that by 150, it's 39. So the recommendation for a tournament, 38, just sits under that 150, that high risk, that high risk area. Now for the parents here, I want you to think about, we are going to go, I'm going to use running as an analogy or a metaphor, I don't know which one, if I came to the school, I would know what it was, but I didn't know what happened, obviously I'm struggling. On the 17th of October this year, we're going to run a 14k race. All right? Level 1, being the blue, is a walk. Level 3 at full intensity is my race pace, and level 2 somewhere in between. That's what we're preparing for. Think of, think of it like that when I talk through this bowling stuff. So here we are. We're on the 10th, and we're starting this week. With the goal of being ready for game 1, 14 overs, or our 14k run. Assuming all being equal, we've been doing nothing. Now there will be people in here who are older, faster, of different ability. No different with bowling. Okay? So for the first week, we're just going to go for a couple of 6k walks. That's what we're going to do to get ready. We're going to get the body ready. So the same thing with bowling, level one. Now that can be really easy in the nets, it can be tennis ball, it can be gym, it can be unstructured, it can be at the beach. It's just anything to get the body going. So if you think about anyone here who hasn't bowled for a while and you go down to the beach and you play cricket with your family, you wake up the next day and you're sore down here, right? It hurts. Same thing applies. You're just starting to get your body back into bowling. Now, anyone here could probably walk 14 k's in one hit. Probably on a one-off. But we don't need to. Because we'd be stiff and sore and couldn't walk for three days. So the same thing applies to bowling. We're just trying to ease our way into it. So for the first week and a bit, we go from twice a week to three times a week, we just extend the distance a bit until we get into week three, which just changes a little bit more, okay? So in week three, we're doing nine here, and we're doing nine here, and you'll see, you'll see the orange here, which means we're lifting the intensity to level two. Now because the blue's at the front, think of it like this. We're walking two poles, and we're running one pole. All right, we're easing into it. We're doing three overs of slow and one over of fast. Now as a coach, you can do that any way you want. You might take those nine overs and go, I want my bowler to be fresh and I want them to roll three overs a bit quicker up front, and then six overs at the back end. And then the next session in here, I'm going to do it the other way. I'm going to get the warm up slow, and when they're a little bit more tired, I'm going to bowl a few more overs of higher intensity at the back end. That's what you can do as a coach. Now you can see as we work through here, we're just introducing a higher intensity through these numbers. Now there's always going to be a spike, through this first bit because you haven't bowled. But through here, you've got your chronic load, slowly increasing, and your acute load. Same thing. Bouncing up and down a little bit, but the goal is just to take this up and these numbers up nice and slow. Get to here, so you start to do a little bit more, your level of intensity here increases, so your level two starts to take over from your slow stuff. And that's the pattern as you move through. Come to the next sheet, same thing applies. You drop out the slow stuff, then you start getting into the full intensity. So again, think of it, you're going from jogging two poles, walking one pole, to jogging, slow jogging your whole run. You're jogging your 9Ks now at a real slow, easy pace. And then you decide, actually I'm feeling good, I've got a little bit of a base behind me, so I'm doing 10Ks today, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jog it, do a nice slow jog at 8K, but I'm going to race 2Ks at my race pace. It's the same thing with the bowling. You start adding in that higher intensity, and you notice when I've brought in the higher intensity, the number of times you're bowling per week has dropped down. So you're balancing it off. You're not over bowling in that week. And the same pattern continues again. Now, here's race day. I'll put 12 there. Now you'll notice one thing about it too is that 
at no time within here have we actually bowled any more than the 14 k's that we're going to walk or bowl on the first match day. Now you think about marathon runners or half or um, half marathon runners, they never run a marathon in preparation to run a marathon. They run about 75% of it. So as long as you've got a decent workload behind you, and you've got to bowl four hangovers, if you can bowl 10 overs at full clip, the adrenaline and the fitness and the base work that you'll do will get you over the line. Okay. Does that make sense? And then over the first course of the month, what I've tried to do is show that you want to expend your energy on the weekend and the games. Now the riskiest part of the season is the start of the season. And so my advice to coaches would be, have a plan. Think about when my games are and work backwards from that once the season starts. If I'm playing Saturday, Sunday, make the week light. Especially for the first month. As I get into the second month, I can start to bring in a little bit more intensity into my trainings because I've been bowling for three months. And the risk of injury goes down. Any questions around this stuff? Does that make sense? So it's that the same. So my son's already had stress fractures, bilateral ones, about 20 months ago. Did a really long build-in last to last season. So for someone who's already had that, is it the same level of intensity and the same sort of build-up, or is it even more cautious? I, 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 I think I think in an ideal world, this is the challenge for everybody here. In an ideal world the build up as long as you can possibly make it. Yep. So for an international bowler, stopping and starting is the worst thing. So you might take a couple of weeks off to refresh and then you want to start again and give yourself as long as you possibly can. Now the problem with a stress fraction, we'll talk about timelines later, it's a 16 week injury and ideally you'd want to have one week of injury as one week of loading back up. What are, what are the issues we've got this year? Is the rugby season's going for longer. You know, it's still going. We've got limited facilities in Christchurch, we've got Lincoln. That's about it. That's all booked out by clubs and everybody already. Yeah. So we're gonna to get to October. Rugby's finished at the end of September. There's a whole group of young men here who have smashed themselves playing rugby, will be fizzed up for the cricket season, will have a couple of weeks, feel good, because they're fit and young and strong, run out on day one, come pull out of the gate, and whammer. Injury. Yeah. So we started three months in last year because we went over to Cute. But we should, if we could, we could should still do the same. 100%. If, if, if in a perfect world, you'd do this for as long as you possibly could and take as long as you, because it's like anything over time, the body just adapts to it. Okay, yep. thank you. So that's what it looks like when you put all that graph together. Now, it should look like a heartbeat, right? So the dark blue, the field in blue here is the chronic bit. And what you want over time is just to slowly raise that chronic up, which is basically increasing your tolerance. The acute stuff, when it goes up, you want to bring it back down. Up, down. Basically rest and recovery. And over the course of the season, when you get to that tournament, and you're sitting around 26 like you want, you're ready to go. You're injury free, you're reasonably fresh, you'll get through the season. So what can you do then as a coach or a player? And Matt's already talked about it, is please keep a diary. If you're a coach, um, I'd, I'd employ you to take the diary for your players, if you can, because it's very, very difficult. You might ask, well, how do you know exactly how many overs you're bowling? I always get my bowlers and my teams to bowl in overs. So if I've got four bowlers in a net, I get them to bowl two on, two off. And then everybody knows how many overs they've bowled. If you've got three bowlers in a net, bowl two on, one off, and someone will bowl two and then they'll rotate out. It's a good way to count. At least, at least then you know exactly how much they've bowled. Ask, please ask the player how many, how much they've bowled. Please. It's the first thing you should do. Have you bowled two days in a row? You know, We don't always work in a perfect world. So look, you are going to bowl, as much as those guidelines say have a rest day, we know we can't do that all the time. We play Saturday, Sunday, group trials, trainings, stuff happens. These are guidelines. It might say 14 overs is the guideline. If you've bowled 14 overs and your team's got four overs left in the day and you're feeling good and you're going for the win, would I say bowl? Bloody oath I'd say bowl. It's part of it. They're just a guideline. You've got to go for it. Now, if you're feeling good at training at a low intensity and you want to bowl a bit more, bowl a bit more. Just write it down how much you're bowling. So that if something happens, you can go back over it and not make the same mistake. Pre-plan. 
So have a think about when your games are, once the season starts, and work backwards. So if you're playing Saturday, Sunday, take it easy during the week. And that's the coach's, um, it's the coach's job, I think, to do that. Always believe that. And then individualise. So everybody is different. You know, there are some rep players, there are some who are not. There are some six foot five big hairy buggers here, and some very short guys who aren't. Everybody is different. It's an individualised program. Not everybody has to bowl eight overs or six overs. Have a chat to your bowler and individualise it. And the biggest one here is um, park your ego to the side. As coaches, players, we all have egos. Mine's huge. And we sometimes don't like being told what to do. Players will be among, amongst a whole range of different teams. You know, you've got your school team, your rep team, you could have a club team, you could be playing first 11, Colts at the school. There could be four or five teams at the same time that a player is playing at. Pick up the phone and talk to another coach, especially at the elite level. What is this player doing? How much are they bowling? I want them to bowl at my training today. Can they have the day off at your training? And we'll swap it over next week. If we can have those types of conversations, we'll be making a massive difference for our players. Now this is an example of the worst case scenario. This is Trent Bolt in 2016, 15. Finish the season, takes a break, goes to the IPL, stinking hot, T20 cricket, so you can't get many overs in. Turns up at England, has a warm up game, boom, 73 overs in a test match. Now the biggest risk after a spike is 21 to 28 days after. Plays another test, comes down into one day cricket, stress fracture. So you often see after a big spike at the first test match of a three test match series, bowlers get injured in the one day game. A, one day cricket's far more fast and more intense, three weeks post. So if you spike, if you have a, a week where you bowl heaps, like Matt said, plan ahead. Three weeks later, I need to have a real quiet week. Chill out. Any more questions around that? Is that clear? I hope it was clear. Questions? Good, so I'm going to hand over, that's the word, that's, that was me, a lot. Injured. So in the worst case scenario, I'm going to hand over to Rob, who as a parent or a player you'd end up going to see, okay? Thank you. Thanks. Oh, thanks, Shane. Yeah, of course, you don't want to see me, and I don't want to see you. <laughs> your, uh, so, most important thing from my point of view, and I've seen these guys over the years, and uh, it's always very, very painful. And of course, as parents, coaches, is that thing on? Yep. Um, most important thing is that look, tonight is about prevention. So, I've got you know, I've got a few docs and physios here from Sports Me today, and, and we don't want to see you. We don't want to see you at all. We would love it if you never had a stress fracture. And, you know, I've seen half a dozen in the last two months. So, you know, it's still happening. Okay, this guy's in trouble now. What I want to demonstrate here is a little bit of anatomy, which is a bit boring, but it's important to understand what we're talking about. This is a normal spine. And right here is the pars. So pars are sort of the bridge between the two joints above and below. And that's the weakest point. And in the young athlete, young cricketer, it's immature, as has been mentioned before, and it's not as strong as an adult bone. And an adult means 24, approximately plus. This is where the fracture occurs, through that pass. And you see a gap just there, it's not there. So that is, in medical terms, a spondylolysis. So that's a fracture through there. Now the worst case scenario then, in some situations, is not only does that fracture not heal, but then the bone slips. And this big long word, spondylitis, it just means it slipped forward. So this vertebrae here has slipped forward, it should be in line with the back of this, the sacrum, and it's slipped forward. So that's a slip. These blue structures here, or this sort of blue-green, they're the disc in there. And this red disc, of course, comes under stress if this bone's moving a bit. So they are the three terms we use. So that's the pars fracture, and this is the slip, which we don't want to see. Okay, so that's where it occurs. Now, why does it occur? Well, you've heard about loading, you've heard about technique. And I guess, excuse <coughs> me, and we've heard about cycling. So this is a model of the spine. 
And the past is back here. So what we don't want is excessive extension and excessive side bend. So when you saw Matt all in alignment, and of course coming through, we don't want a lot of rotation down backwards, which stresses that pass, which is where the fractures occur. So technique's really important. But that's why that's why that bit breaks because it's immature and you stress it if you collapse into that side. So that's why it occurs quite apart from all the loading stuff. Now why is it important to prevent? Well clearly you've heard about how much cricket Shane missed, and Matt missed, I don't know, he might have missed at least one and a half seasons, thereabouts, with his practice. And as a youngster, you're going to miss a whole season, absolute minimum. We've talked about, you know, six weeks, uh, well, we're going to talk about it in a minute, but basically you're four months off bowling, at least once you're pain free. And so we're going to talk about um, well, that's, so that's uh, an example. Oh, sorry. So that's demonstrating a fracture through the bone there. It's a CT scan showing a fracture through the bone. Those of you with imagination, we talk about a Scotty dog or the body, two legs down here a neck, a head, and there's a fracture, we often call it, talk about the collar on the dog, which we don't want. One of the points about this, this is a complete fracture, it goes right through the bone and comes out the other top. If you ask me how many of these fractures heal, if they're a complete fracture, it's less than 10%. So that's the scary thing. Less than 10% of these fractures, if they're complete, will heal. Next slide, this side here shows the slip again on an X-ray, this is just a plain X-ray, showing the slip of this vertebrae forward, it should be in a line with this. So that line there should be on. So this has slipped about 25% uh, from its original position. Now, the other point about why it occurs is that uh, when we stress tissues and it's muscle, tendon, ligaments, when you stress bone, bone re does respond to stress by increasing its strength. And how it does that is these cells called osteoclasts, they actually remove bone to allow the osteoclast to put new bone back. So there's a vulnerable period as the bone's remodeling and the osteoclasts take bone away, if you do not, if you continue loading at a high level, then you can get a fracture. So because the physiology of bone is that it takes bone away to put new bone back, we have this vulnerable period. Now that doesn't happen in muscle and tendons and ligaments. They just keep remodeling and they don't take away tissue. Bone gets stronger by some being taken away. So that's why we always want to stress the, the, the loading and the rest and recovery as part of the natural process. And of course what happens in a natural progress without a uh, fracture is that you continue to have normal bone and it gets stronger and stronger. So it's really important to appreciate. Now what do we do if you get back pain? Now this is a little bit busy but hopefully you can follow it. Number one, whoops, sorry. Number one, you stop bowling. So you stop bowling in review with the physio or sports doctor. If it improves, you can return to bowling. And we're talking there about a week or so, week, if it's not settling, we want to uh, assess this. Now the reason I'm saying we want to assess it quite quickly is that if you have an incomplete fracture, then it can progress to a complete fracture. And as I've demonstrated, suggested before, complete fractures don't heal. Basically regarded as a non-healing fracture. Now that's not necessarily the worst thing in the world because many non-healed fractures become pain-free for the rest of your life. However, there is the chance that they will stay pain-free for months and that's what worries us. Secondly, you can get the slip, which is uncommon but we also worry about. Okay, so what we want is to review, see you relatively quickly and we may investigate for stress fracture. That will always include an X-ray, and if we're really worried, we'll go on to an MRI scan.
we would then check that, see you again. There's no stress injury. We look for other things like muscles and ligaments and work on the technique and the physio will guide that. If there's a stress injury, then we'll talk about that. So what do we do? I'm oh, sorry, these ones here show a couple of things which are important. This is uh, one of the gentlemen to my right in the corner here who had an x-ray. Totally normal. And an MRI scan, now it's a little bit technical here, but just there, there's a, what we call a hot spot. So there's an increased intake of the, uh, with the bone activity just there, as opposed to this one. So that suggests to us there's something happening in that bone, followed by a CT, which shows a fracture. The important point about this is absolutely normal X-ray, but a fracture was present. So an X, a normal X-ray does not exclude a fracture, but we always do them because if there is a fracture and we see it, then it's there. We just have to work out whether it's old or new. So this is a fracture present on a CT when a normal X-ray is present. Now this is the newer, newer stuff technique. CTs, those of you who have medical uh, knowledge, will know that involves radiation, and we don't want to irradiate our young athletes. This here is a vibe with a new technique called, uh, sorry, MRI with vibe, and it demonstrates the fracture running up through there, which is the same fracture as here. This is a CT, this is an MRI with vibe and the MRIs have no radiation. So that is why the MRI is the preferred uh, modality to assess these now, MRI with vibe, and we're trying to avoid doing CTs, particularly in our young players, and I guess adults as well. So the vibe MRI is really important. And for uh, any other doctors who I don't know in the audience, if you're going to organise an MRI, please ask for the vibe sequences. They're done at the same time, and they don't uh, cost any more. Okay, my last slide, I think. What happens if you've got a fracture? Okay, firstly, no bowling for at least four months. And that's all our recovery is non-negotiable pain-wise. If you have pain, then you can't advance. You're still resting if you have pain. So pain is a non-negotiable symptom. You can't start bowling and doing stuff. Sorry, so if you've got a fracture, you're not going to bowl for four months, no running or swimming. People say, why about swimming? Why swimming? Well, swimming, if you imagine an eel, something that slides around, uh, you know, and your back's swimming, swimming around. And if you, think of, if you think of other fractures, we would normally cast an arm or a leg or something. In the back, you can't do that, practically. So we cannot cast the back, so we don't bother. So, but we want to keep the, the, the fracture side as still as possible. So, you can walk, you can bike, you can do some gym work as long as it's pain free, but relatively static positions. Physiotherapy led rehab program, which will always be pain free. Once you're pain free, there's a review, a review of the contributing factors, including technique. But now the technique, of course, you can't be adequately assessed until you're back bowling. So that has to be quite, quite, late, quite late in recovery. And then return to bowling over at least 8 to 10 weeks after the four months rest. So you're seeing we're getting up to six months. Now what about surgery? What's the role of surgery in these, as you know, you know, these guys over here all had surgery. Well, how many of them? But, yeah, so most. Surgery is pretty much uh, left, uh, is designed only for the mature athlete. So most of our adolescents will not have surgery. Okay? You have to probably be at least 20 before any of our surgeons would consider surgery on a stress fracture. And it's only on the basis of ongoing pain and loss of, if you like, healing. And of course, we heard someone had a fracture, someone's son. And sometimes, of course, the fracture, it may seem to be healed, everything going well, pain-free, and then breaks down again once you get up to high intensity. So a second fracture would be an indication to consider surgery, and we would ask our surgical colleagues to consider that. But as a rule, 
if you have a fracture, you will not be, be thought, you will not be sent for surgery in the first place. Second thing I want to re reiterate the point that most strip fractures, if they are completely through the bone, will not heal. But most of those become pain free. And one relatively recently retired New Zealand fast bowler had pars defect from fractures that he bowled with until his mid 30s, and it wasn't these fellows who did not have surgery and who was pain free. So his fractures, despite not healing, did not stop his career. So it's not the disaster you might think it always is, but in fact, we want to prevent them, and that's what tonight's been about. Now, I know there's several people in this audience I can spot who have had fractures and I've seen them, but we don't want to talk about their experiences. But has anyone got any questions right now um, about that medical stuff? Not a question. Okay, we'll have some more time later. Amos. Now, in terms of the... Dale Shaker is now going to talk about the physio the, to some extent, rehabilitation program. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> okay, so uh, Rob's talked about the time frames. Um, so I'll just briefly go through this and hopefully you don't have to go through this because you don't, it, it is long and it's hard. Um, some of these guys have been through it a couple of times. Um, so they don't, it's uh, bad memories for them. Um, I think the hardest part is, um, and especially around physio stuff, but as, as um, athletes as well, is that you, you feel pretty good pretty quickly and virtually the only thing you can't do is bowl um, as far as pain goes. Um, so this becomes really hard work, um, as I said, because you, you do feel really good. Um, but basically, you've got relative rest six weeks. So as Rob said, uh, maybe some biking, some uh, unloaded exercise, but it's pretty low level. Um, and that's to let things really settle down. Between the six weeks and the, the 16 weeks is a progressive loading. And that will, uh, for the, um, as far as strength goes, um, depending on your age um, and how, how mature you are as far as an exercise uh, person goes, depends on what you do, but um, it'll be basically um, some strength work and then leading into running, which will then lead you into your bowling. Um, all of that stuff has to be pain free. The problem with these, if you've got pain, then, then things aren't going so well. So it's hard to, um, sometimes people will try and get back to running if you've hurt your ankle, it might hurt a little bit, but you can kind of keep going and you can run through it. These types of things you can't. Generally speaking, if you've got pain, then things aren't going very well. Um, the next part, the, the three months, is your uh, bowling, and it's a graduated bowling. Shane's talked about the intensity, and that's generally what you're trying to do, over building a little bit of volume and building the intensity, and you work away at that for two or three months, and that takes you back to game time. So it's a, it's a long process. It's relatively boring. Um, and, and can be hard work, and, and I'd say that, you know, mentally, mentally it is hard work because you feel like you just want to go, um, but having had some experience, um, that's where we need to keep you to, to a rigid program. Um, should I join this one? Yeah. Um, so, basically, for, I suppose this is more in the medical, the physio terms, um, if you have back pain associated with bowling, then we have a high suspicion of a stress fracture. And really there's no tests, apart from the ones that Rob's talked about, there's no little things that we can do um, that give you an answer. So almost until you can prove it isn't by some of the imaging, or if they get better really quickly, then they can get back to bowling you know, in a few days and it's um, pain free then we, we would have a high suspicion that someone has some sort of stress-related injury. Um, the previous bowling load, if they've had a big spike, Shane talked about, that gives you a bit of a, 
indication as well that things might be um, more likely than not. So if they've you know had a big big week, they've come off nothing pre-season, as we've talked about the rugby season, come off a rugby season, no bowling, a uh, couple of weeks of back into training and big games, etc., and then they come with back pain, you've got a reasonable suspicion again. The winter sports load is a, a, a things around high loading for the back. So we're talking things like basketball, volleyball, jumping sports, um, spinal compression, uh, even things like uh, into your um, scrummaging, so for rugby, where you're getting compression through scrummaging. So all of those kind of things can add load to the spine, and then you add the bowling on top of that. That again can, can uh, give you a suspicion that things aren't going so well in the back. Um, I think from a, again from a physio perspective, preparing your athletes, um, generally speaking, some kind of uh, core strengthening. It's a very generic term and it can mean uh, different things to different people, but trying to get some control of, of the player's um, pelvis and their lumbar spine, um, I think is, a, is an important thing. It can, again, it can be very difficult with young guys that are trying to get them to do low level things. I think Matt's talked about this in, in our previous uh, discussions is that um, trying to get those low level exercises done is, is again a little bit mind numbing but they're very really important. Um, and then I think um, the, the general fitness, um, we've talked about that. Um, basically I think it as well, with, we talk about rugby a wee bit, um, but rugby, generally speaking, at, you know, preparing for rugby, people want to put on size from a rugby perspective because that's your armour, you've got to bash into people. It's not really what we want as a cricketer because um, the more load you have on the on the top, the harder it is to, to lug around and just put, puts more load onto your onto your body. It also tends to stiffen you up a bit. Um, and if you haven't got the suppleness in your uh, muscles uh, to bowl, then you're gonna have to get it from somewhere else. And that means that you're gonna start to bend and twist a little bit in your spine. So those are just some general things around the the rehab. Do you want to talk about this one? Oh. This is just a general rule if you're doing strength, and I'm not a strength and conditioning coach at all, I wouldn't pretend. But basically, when people ask me, what can I do? Should our young athletes be doing strength training? And the answer is yes. And we talk about years of, if you like, years of training, or training years, rather, which is, so if you start when you're 14, 15 doing some strengthening, then by the time you get to 20, 21, when you can really start loading, you've got training years under your belt. It's like Shane talked about the running. This is over years. But the rules I normally explain is that you should not try and compete with your mates. Okay, so you young fellas here, you shouldn't try and beat him or him or him. It's only about you, okay, what you can do. Secondly, your repetitions and your sets should always be in double figures. So you shouldn't be doing, you know, sets of six and struggling. There also should be double figures. So you're doing relatively high reps, low loads in your, in your early years. You should never go to failure. In other words, if you're doing three sets and your third set you can't complete it, it means you've got too much weight on. You've got to back off. Good techniques important, supervised if possible if you've got, you know, a good gym that where you've got a trainer and the school's got a good sort of trainer, then good supervision of your techniques important. And obviously it's going to be related to training age. So your training age is how many years you've done some strength training. But strengthening is really important. And uh, you've heard Matt talk about once he matured, he got more strength, more core, and he could stand there doing Dale's exercises without any shaking around, which is a good sort of example of, of you know, making sure that you progress it slowly so you get stability, because stability is one of the most important things that's been touched on today. I think... Um, Conclusion, James. All right, thank you, Rob. So uh, what things do I want you guys to take away from tonight?
So there's kind of three main points around loading. One, we want to kind of bowl between 20 and 30 overs per week. And with not preferably a rest after each session. And then we're trying to bowl between about two and four sessions per week. So there are our three points around loading. The second thing is let's all try and keep bowling diary. Now this is really important because if you do have an injury, and then we can actually look back and see what you've done and what you've coped with or you haven't coped with. Third thing, if you've got back pain while you're bowling, we've got to, so, got to go see a physio or a doctor. The earlier we can pick it up, you know, maybe we can bring, prevent a, a full stress fracture going on, or maybe we can actually work out how there's nothing going on there at all and get back into it. And the last thing from tonight is just communication. You know, talk to your coaches, talk to your players, talk to your physios, keep everyone in the loop. So we've uh, worked with Canterbury Cricket and uh, we're going to put up a resource page on their website. So this will include a, a copy of the presentation, it will include all the bowling guidelines that we've been referring to tonight, uh, it will have a list of uh, health professionals that you can contact if, you, if you've got any issues, uh, and we'll also put on the, uh, uh, the bowling loading templates that Shane came up with tonight, uh, and there will also be a list of uh, specialist bowling coaches as well. Um, so that will be up on the uh, Canterbury Cricket website shortly. So that brings us to the end of the presentation tonight. So thank you very much for your time. Hopefully the man down the back there is being a little bit better. Yeah, good stuff. Um, so you're welcome to leave now if you want to, but uh, we are going to hang around for more questions. So um, yeah, if you've got any, please come up and talk to us. All right, thanks very much.